So I'm delighted to be able to welcome the director of uh, Amy onto the stage. Would you please welcome Asif Kapadia? Thank you. So what's going to happen is that I'm going to hog at it for a little bit and talk about Amy and all the various uh, questions that the, the film throws up. Uh, but the, the, the real joy of this is that you then get to uh, ask him questions as well. We have a roving microphone and a, a glamorous assistant. Uh, so put your hands up uh, when the time comes uh, and uh, you too can ask Asif Kapadia the burning questions. Um, Asif, it's obviously uh, a, a tremendously moving, heartbreaking film. Did you know it would be that that would be the, t the the tone of the piece going in? Did you know it would be what you've called it yourself a, a heavy film? Um, evening, everyone. Hello. Um, I, I, I'm, let's be honest. We knew the ending. I mean, we all. If you know anything, sadly, you know the ending of her her story and her life. So it was always quite clear it was going to be a heavy film. We're going to have to deal with that anyway. Um, I didn't really know enough at the beginning to know. <clears throat> what the beginning would be or what the middle would be, but it, I knew it was heading in a certain direction because I kind of remember it all. I kind of felt slight, kind of, it was, I lived in Kentish Town for about 10 years when all of this was going on in Camden. And um, so I was aware enough to think, okay, it wasn't, it wasn't a particularly happy period of life. Um, but the, the, I suppose for that reason, the revelation was um, meeting people and talking to people, meeting her friends and eventually getting them to trust me enough and all of them saying, no, 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 she was amazing, she was funny, she was witty, she was this incredible human being. I'm like, mm, I haven't seen that. Um, and that became the thing. It was actually like, can you make a film about Amy and somehow show this other side of her? That, that was the job, really. I, I think you, you've done that as well, but you've used the, the, this, this kind of format of documentary that you, you, you first used in Senna uh, a couple of years ago, which I don't know if anyone's seen. You've seen Senna as well? Hey! Quite good. Yeah, good. Did very well. Um, when you were BAFTA. And that too has a tragic ending uh, uh, as well. I'm not saying that you're drawn to the, these tragic figures. But, but weirdly enough, the Senna's story was like a, a kind of a feel good story. It's amazing. He had this certain personality and he had a way of living his life that was incredibly positive. And so he died really young, yet there was this kind of uplifting thing about being in, around him. And, and what weirdly enough, what happens when you make these films is you get a sense of what it's like to be around that person by meeting everyone around him. And his life was just surrounded by positivity. Sadly, Amy's was like the inverse. Sadly, when, when I was talking to people around Amy, it was heavy, dark, a lot of paranoia, a lot of guilt, a lot of tension, a lot of accusations. There was a lot of just like darkness. And I think that's what was interesting. So even though they both died young, they kind of lived a very different way. Um, and that, that's kind of the big thing that came out of it. So, people would just literally contact me however they could with Senna and say, I hear you making a film about him. I love this guy. I would do anything for him. How can I help? Mm. <clears throat> Sadly, it was the opposite with Amy. It was literally like, no, not interested. Don't want to do it. No, don't care. What am I going to get out of it? No, not interested. And it was that, that's kind of what we started dealing with at the beginning. Why do you think that is? I mean, obviously she was, a, a, as we've seen from your film, she was a funny, witty, amusing, lively girl. She made fantastic songs, uh, the lyrics of which you put front and centre, I think, for us all to see and reappreciate. You reappraise re the music, if anything. Why do you think people were sort of nervous about their relationship? I mean, first of all, there was, there was an issue that I had initially, okay, so somebody at Universal Music in the UK, head of Universal Music, David Joseph, <coughs> excuse me, talking too much, um, had liked Senna, had called up the producer of Senna, James Gay Reese, and said, you know, oh, I really like that film. Would you be interested in making a film about Amy? I could get you the music. And James was interested and called me up and said, what do you think? And I, and I was like, okay, shot. what was the beginning of that question? Because I've gone off on a tangent so far. I've forgotten who I am. <laughs> what was it? I wish I could remember. It was, who um, am I? It was, uh, it, it was, she was very exciting and, and lively, but what, so why right. do you think there was right. so much darkness? Right, thank you. Cease. Good. So, so, so then I start talking to people and nobody wants to talk. And the reason being, this was the point about it, I got that call and it's only been a year after she died. It was very soon. So James calls me up and I go, I think it's too soon. I don't think we should be making this film. I'm not sure how comfortable I am. Who wants to get into that right now? But, but I thought, okay, Senna took five years to make. I have no idea how long this is going to make. So I did a little bit of research. I said, while well, you you have to sort out the music. We have to have the music, the publishing, the estate. Everyone has to be on board. While you do that, let me do a bit of homework. So I just started doing some research and just looking online. 
the thing about Amy was either she was incredibly brilliant or it was really dark and heavy. There was no middle. There was nothing in between. She was funny, she was brilliant, or the, kind of the opposite. And I just felt like okay, there's always something going on around her. And I guess that point was when I thought, okay, there's a story. Something's happened here. I don't understand. I don't understand why she's on stage. I don't understand why she's doing these shows when she's in that state. And it felt like it was very much a film about this city. It felt like a film about London, about North London, about Camden. But somehow I felt a part of it, and I felt like it was a part of us. So that was the reason I guess I wanted to do it. I wanted to do it because I haven't made a film at home for a long time. And finally, this felt like the subject to get my teeth yeah, Because Senna's all about Monte Carlo and, you it's know... It's a guy and, from and another Brazil. planet. And she was like the girl next door. You know, there's something about her that I could have gone to school with her. I could have known her. And, you, you know, I might have bumped into her somewhere. And it just felt that this felt very personal. Before I started it, it felt... I never met her, never saw her live. As far as I know, I never crossed paths with her, but it felt like it was a personal story. Mm. When you do a documentary, uh, which is what you, you sort of do, but you kind of change the, not the rules of documentary, but I think what people expect now of documentary, there used to be that this was true and it, it kind of happened, but you've kind of sculpted a, a biopic out of documentary materials. Well, do you have a responsibility then to, to kind of get it exactly right? I know you're a stickler for getting it right as well, but yet you do create this, this story, a three-act story, where life is not as tidy as that. Yeah, I suppose I'm, I'm kind of making it all up as I'm going along, to be honest. I, my background is in fiction and in drama and from writing and directing films. And um, so I don't come from a kind of doing interviews kind of background. I worked in TV when I had to do that and I quit. I didn't really like it. So, so I kind of stumbled into it by making Senna, which is my first long doc. <coughs> and on that film, I just did my research, saw the material and thought, this is all amazing. I mean, this is the best set of rushes I've ever seen, you know. I don't believe no one's ever made this before. So it, my instinct was, it's all there. Why do I need to interview anyone? That, that was it. It was just like, I'll show you. I, I can see it's all here. Mm -hmm. With Amy, it, it ended up in a similar technique, but it started the opposite because nobody wanted to be a part of the film. Nobody wanted to speak or open up because it was all so painful that I did audio interviews. And I met with them, and I just said, well, if you're happy to just talk to me, we'll, we'll have a chat. This is the piece of paper. Unless you sign that piece of paper, I can't use the interview. So it's up to you. You can walk away, but at least I have an idea of what's going on. And that's what it was. It just, I just started talking to people. So this film started entirely out of audio, and there were no images. I had no idea if there was a film for a long time. But bit by bit, everybody would kind of open up, and really the first person who opened up was Nick Shemansky, her, her first manager, who started off, as you said, as a kind of runner in the office. And Nick, he liked Senna and trusted me, I guess. We just got along. And he really suddenly started telling me this story about Amy, about this amazing person and how they met and how, you know, he was a part of her life and got her the record deal and then they went off to here and they did this and they went off there and it was just, he knew it all up to a certain point. Um, and I'd asked him already if he had any footage and he said no. But once he trusted me and once we kind of hung out a bit, he said actually, like, and he opened his laptop up and he just said, well, I've got this video and this video and this video and all of that stuff at the beginning of them performing and hanging out in the car, mm -hmm. it was all stuff he shot. Um, and that's kind of thought, okay, we've got a film. That's the, almost yeah. the, the revelation of the film. That's when you think, okay, I've never seen that girl before. You know, the act, the kind of, it's not necessarily great shot footage, but the kind of intimacy of she's doing her makeup in the loo, she's sitting in the car, chatting, sleeping, you know, just talking to him mm -hmm. and therefore talking to us, talking to the audience, was something I thought straight away that stood out. I thought that's unusual. You don't get that kind of access mm -hmm. with someone unless it's kind of self consciously done now where they're faking it. And this wasn't fake, this was the real thing. He, she's just chatting to Nick, ignoring the camera. When, you, when you're, get, you're getting all that material together and then you sort of have it all around you or, I don't, on, a, on a wall or something, I think you, you kind of yeah. plot it out in the wall. And, but in a way, what you, you have created a, 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 an almost kind of classic piece with a, a sort of a tragic spiral and a, 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 a sort of ineluctable fate. And then you've got this kind of, they've got a bit of a villain or, and we've got a hero, a hero and hero. You've even got a romantic interest there. And I think that you've got, Blake is a romantic. You've also got, I think, Nick Schmansky, who is kind of sort of unrequitedly, I, I don't know this, but, but he feels to me that he was unrequitedly in love with Amy at, at various stages. And we I think we everyone fell in love with her. Yes. I think she had this thing, and they all talked about it, and I've met a lot of people who said, Amy just had something. When you were with her, like you were the only person that was around, that existed. And she, it's a really weird thing where I would meet people all over the world that I interviewed, and um, everyone would say they were her best friend. I mean, it's kind of thing I've never heard so many people saying they were someone's best friend, 
but they all, none of them spoke to one another. None of them even knew, some of them didn't even know about one another. And they were around for a short period of time, but there was this kind of intensity that she had that made you, like he sort of says, you were the only one. She made you special and then she could just dump you. Um, and journalists would say that. Journalists who interviewed her, met her once, would have this connection and thought, you know, this is something really deep going on. And then meet her a few years later and, you know, when things weren't so good, she just slammed her face, the door in her face. And, and uh, that was it. And, and you could see they were sort of heartbroken. So there was something about her char charisma or something about her personality that made the people feel special. Mm. Um, she had something. Obviously, the, the, the story around the film, it kind of escaped people's attention, has created some kind of contro controversy. And there's her, her father and her family are, are saying that they're not best pleased with the, with the result. How do you feel about that? Did you, I mean, you, you must have known that you were going to create something that not everyone was going to love because it's what you saw. But were you expecting quite that reaction? I don't know. I mean, when we started the film, we did make it clear to everyone that, look, we, we have to deal with what happened at the ending because we all are aware of it. Everyone knows it. She's this image that I see of her in the newspapers. It's not great, okay? We, are, we all understand this is how she's represented and seen. And so if we're going to make this film, one, you have to let us speak to everyone we want to speak to. Essentially, we will make the film. You have never made a film before. Let us get on and make it. And um, we're just going to be as honest as we can. And that was it. And kind of that's what happened. They left us alone. We went off and we made the film. And then... You know, there is a part of the process where we show the film to the contributors. Everyone that played a part in it, just to say, this is what we're talking about, we got it right, we got it wrong. Um, her father mainly has been the one, I don't think there's anyone else that's come out actually from the family, it's just oh him, just, just that issue. But I think the nature of the research and the nature of everything that we've seen, all I can say is the film is an honest representation of everything that we came across, but it's not trying to point the finger at any single person, it's just a whole group of people and circumstances and her decisions and everything is so complicated. Real life is so much more complicated than any script I could write. <coughs> and that was it. We just decided we had, we kind of owed it to her. It's her story. It's about her. Somewhere in her life, she got lost. Mm. Everyone else was making these calls. They weren't necessarily making them for her. And we were making the film. We all kind of fell in love with her. We're making it for her. And we've got to show what was going on. Mm. And it wasn't always comfortable for people, but it wasn't great for her. She's the one who died. She's the one who kind of was humiliated on stage. So in the end, I felt that's who I'm making it for. Either we make the film or we don't make the film and we decided we should just make the film because we're here now. Yeah. And now I know too much. Mm. And, and so um, that's all we've tried to do. We, we, honestly, it's, I'm not the kind of guy who would spend three years to pick on someone. It's not, that's not what I'm here to do. Um, and people, once they've seen the film, most people have said, okay, some people don't come out of it great, but it doesn't seem to be a finger-pointing exercise at an individual. Hopefully, when people see it, that's what I think. I think a part of the, 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 the thing it's closest to is a tragedy, uh, and I do think it's a tragedy. We watch this, this, this person go, a music tragedy in a way that we see this person go down. It is a musical as well, but we see this person down with a smile. So I think that there's, we all want to stop it. We all want to, they're, they're, you say there's a blame game going on. I think anyone who's just seen it will kind of go, well, you know, is the dad to blame? Is the lover to blame? Is the music industry to blame? Are the paparazzi to blame? Are the media to blame? Are we complicit voyeurs in this, watching this movie and watching her tragedy, consuming her, the pictures of her with, with her feet in, in the newspapers? We're to blame. And a tragedy does that to the audience. It makes them complicit in the tragedy. So there's, as you say, there's no finger pointing, but you all, I think it's we all feel a bit guilty. Yeah, and it's kind of the reason why I felt... Well, actually, there's a reason why this needs to be made now, because we all still can remember that period. It was very recent. Um, and it just felt like there was something else going on here. We are... I felt a part of it, right? I was living in that part of town, and this was going on down the street, and there were 50 guys outside this girl's door, and I didn't do anything about it, you know? I don't know. Maybe I should have. Maybe I shouldn't have. I don't know. It just felt weird that we just let this go on. And, um, and we knew it was going on. We everyone knew, knew, it, we knew it was going, going didn't we? And we all saw Serbia. We weren't there. We all clicked on it, we all viewed it, people shared it, people commented it. Oh my, hilarious, look what I wrote about her. <laughs> I've met journalists who interviewed her, perhaps who faced up to her and chased her, and people who dressed up as Halloween and Halloween parties as Amy. And, you know, a lot of people have been kind of coming back and saying, yeah, I, I can't believe it, we just kind of did this stuff. And it's not just here. We, a lot of people in L England, or London specifically, knew of Amy before Back to Black. But if you go around the world, they only know Back to Black onwards. Americans only know after she won the Grammys. She never gave an interview, really, after Back to Black came out. Hardly, anyway. So they just saw this person who wasn't able to speak, who wasn't really in good shape, 
and they really were tough on her. They were nasty to her in the States. And I think it's been interesting seeing it there because they've had almost a bigger journey because it's a real shock when they see actually she's actually quite sweet and funny and intelligent. Mm. And, you know, I was quite nasty to her. And a lot of... It's, it's been it's interesting. Really How much... The only person who, who I feel doesn't get blamed is the heroine herself, the tragic heroine herself. I think is she makes a lot of calls. I don't know about blame, but, you know, we all make decisions in life. She changed management. I don't know if you pick who you fall in love with, but, you know, she fell in love with a certain guy. There were lots of nice boys around. Um, you know, she made certain decisions. She could have gone with a nice Jewish boy. She may well have. <laughs> she may well have. But um, she ended up with the other guy. Um, so, so, they always do. Yeah, so... They're all Jewish, actually. <laughs> no, um, that, that, that was the thing. She made decisions. I don't know. I think it is so much more complicated. That's what I would say. I, d I think she w is a part of her story. Mm. She isn't. She was the most intelligent person in the room, always, with anyone else in that group that you see, you know? When you make a documentary, like that, which this is, in a, in a sort of way, can you, can you see it? And there are rumours persisting that both Senna and this will become fiction films. Could you see someone playing Amy? I doubt see Senna it will fiction? become a fiction film. I think they're trying, but I don't think it will. Um, <coughs> I don't know. I don't know if I care about someone pretending to be these people, personally. Um, Even an actress or an actor? Yeah, yeah I don't know. I want to hear her. Mm. I want to hear her pick up a guitar and just sing this acoustic version and with a crappy videotape, you've got bloody hell she's good. Mm. That's, that's what I'm impressed by, I don't know. I, someone pretending to do it or miming or even if they can sing. I, I'm always watching those actors going, are they meant to be good or are they pretending to be bad? Or I don't know, I don't know. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm meant to be impressed because an actor's sung. I don't know, I don't get it. So I'm, I'm like, I don't know. so yeah, I don't know if I want to see anyone pretending. I've heard awful stories about who might be in a film about her, but I don't know. Could, if, if, they, if you were to script a film like that, it would, ha it, it would probably require, strange enough, that script meetings go happier endings or something like that. I, I'm pretty sure that conversation happened with Senna when lots of studios tried to make it. Certain things would come up where they go, it's great, we love it, it's fantastic. Does he have to be Brazilian? <laughs> Does he have to die? Can't he be kind of from middle America and drive a NASCAR? And that's why it never happened, because there's always some development process that ruins anything that's original or interesting, I guess. Mm. So. No, well, we never, we never, it may, it may still happen. I, I do see it. Nothing as, to me. I do see it as a fantastic musical, and I think that what, what you have done. It is a musical. Yeah. It, did, you know, did you think that when you were making it? I did. It? It's yeah. my Bollywood film. Yeah, yeah. This is it. <laughs> This is it. The and songs are the narrative. This yeah. is it. And that, I think, certainly comes across that the, the, we, we're getting a, a cultural reappraisal of, of all that happened, but we're also getting this musical reappraisal of how good her lyrics were, how good her I mean, her writing was. was a massive thing, you know. That, there was a point when I suddenly... I was listening to her records in the car. Oh, <laughs> CDs. And then um, I just went away, after having done a bit of research, just read the lyrics, just as a piece of writing. You know, like, bloody hell, that's good. And another one, and another one, another one. You just go, it's all here. She's written it all down at the ages 17, 18, she wrote Frank. 19, 20, 21, she wrote Back to Black. And it's just like, these lyrics are incredible because they're, they're not trying to copy Americans. They're very English, they're very London. They've got lots of little twists of humour and references. And it was just like, it seems like really stupidly simple. Let's just put the lyrics on the screen. You know, that's her at her most eloquent. That is it. It's and just, very intimate to it's see the map. The, the map was there. I just had it upside down or backwards or something. And then you look at it, you're going, this is her life story and her life journey. She kind of was aware of all of her issues about men, about... So where did you get those, the, the access to the books? Because I, I find those, that's so... Her diaries are, yeah, yeah really that, I find that so uh, revealing and so, so close. You feel like you're into her So heart. all of this material that you see turned up in really strange places all over the world. From these hundred people that I spoke to, everyone had a certain memento or a photo or an answer phone message or... And some of it would pop up in Miami or in LA or New York or in Germany or, you know, different people had random things. I suppose the only way I could put it is, um, you know, in the dark days, um, Amy's door was kind of open door. People walked in and out. You know, everyone and anyone could kind of just walk in there and do whatever they wanted to do. And certain people, a lot of stuff was nicked and stolen and ended up in tabloids and stuff. Certain people said, um, I'm going to take care of things and keep it under my bed and if ever you want it back, you can have it back, and then she died. And there's loads of kind of stories behind stories. So somebody had some diaries, and her mum had diaries, and her mum gave us some of her diaries, and that's where the writing came from. Mm. Another thing I love about the film, is that this would never happen in a fiction film, is that in a fiction film, it would all look the same. Whereas this, it looks like modern life. It's iPhone, it's, it's kind of done on, you know, there's video, there's Super 8, there's, there's yeah. writing material, there's all sorts of stocks of material. There's like material. freeing yourself up. Well, you couldn't do that if you were it. No, that kind of came out of Senna of just saying, it doesn't matter what it looks like. People, if it's emotionally true, 
if that's the real moment in time where something happened, you don't care what it looks like, I guess. Yeah. So that, that to me, makes it, makes it all the more modern and urgent. Right, I have hogged you. I said I would. Uh, and now I'm going to throw you open to the East End Film Festival audience, uh, Asif. So any questions for Asif Kapadia? Um, okay, the gentleman down, he was very quick off the draw. So he, he and his trainers. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Um, just a quick question about the editing process. Um, given that Amy's life was completely um, like an open door in itself to the media and we saw how it transpired, um, I was just wondering how you find the, route, the right balance in the edit um, where we, we got enough information, because it's very intimate, but where you, it could have easily gone down another direction where it was a bit, we were seeing a bit too much. Um, so I was just wondering like, if you could explain about that process. So the editor is Chris King, who cut, was one of my editors on Senna, who did the Banksy film Exit as well. He's, um, he's great, he's very tough. We have a kind of good working relationship. Um, I think that's our job, you know. I guess we start off with a mass of stuff. It all comes in at different time. You don't end up with a box that neatly gives you all the material. You find certain things off YouTube. Someone gives you an audio tape. I'm doing, I'm doing interviews while the editor's cutting, while the researcher's, Paul Bell is here, who's our archive producer, who's doing, his team are kind of looking and researching. So all of this is happening at the same time. And then we just spent, we probably edited for two years. And the whole film took about three years. So the whole thing was just like bit by bit moulding, sculpting it. How many hours of stuff have you got? I don't know, I, I kind of lose track. I think if I made up a number like 9,000 hours, it could be more. Because there's so many shots when you get... To, I just made up. Um, <laughs> the, 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 there are so many concerts that she did with, like, 20 cameras. And, like, you look at it and it goes straight away, you go, that's not a great concert, I'm not going to use it. But there are 20 hours, 20 cameras filming everything from every position. So you, it multiplies a lot. The, the, the early period, there isn't a lot. You know, the behind-the-scenes stuff, there's one person with a camera, and it's really uh, Nick, Julie, uh, Nick and Lauren mainly, and we got some home videos from her mum. Um, and then we had a few photographs from Juliet. But the rest of the time, it was like we were just relying on what we could find in bits and pieces. So. But I think that, that that's the challenge. The challenge is that's where it's written and directed is in the edit. And you have to just try to keep screening it. One of the things we do is we screen the film quite a lot at different stages to people. <coughs> How does it work when it's long? You know, it's four hours, three hours, two and a half, two. And you try to kind of fit it in. And then you've got to... <clears throat> on this film we had to cover a few kind of legal things as well so there's a few times we had to just make sure we could release the film so there was a kind of various stages we need to just get it checked uh, the gentleman here was next yeah thank you it was a, it was a fantastic achievement um, uh, the question I had kind of like continuing on what you were talking about as well um, the, the, the film felt at points that it's sort of like didn't really care anymore about what happened exactly when, and it just, there were these spaces in between the actions where it was quite intimate and close, and you know, we didn't know which pop she was or when it was between which concert, and I felt like that was com something quite, like a, a dramatical sort of way of, uh, like saying, I don't actually care, I need to actually understand her as a character and get close to her. I just wanted to see what was that like a struggle between the responsibility that you talked about, that making sure that you tell it as clearly and as accurately as possible versus trying to actually use her as a, as a character in a film and create the right level of pace and space. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I, yes. Um, I don't know. I think, I think uh, you, didn't, you might have to be a bit more specific. It's late. Um, I, I, think, I think the way it became is that it was just like, a lot of it is a bit like cutting drama, where you're just in the mood, and I'm not worried about the kind of detail of what pub it is. It's all London, it's all Camden, or it's all happening somewhere, but it's just hanging out with her and kind of being and seeing what's going on, and it's a particular chunk of time, and then you leap forward and it's another year. So it's almost like that was her in a particular phase, I guess, without being too literal. That, what, that's why we don't have voiceover and stuff like that. You have people commenting on what's going on, but it's not getting quite so detailed into every specific thing. A lot of this stuff you probably already know. It's already out there on YouTube, so, or, or on the internet, on Wikipedia. So it's more about kind of just getting a sense of her life and her being, I guess. Um, I was just taking um, from what you said earlier about um, that we all know, that everybody knew what was going on with Amy Winehouse. We all knew she was sick and everyone that knew her knew she was sick and no one did anything. And I wondered if you were trying to make a broader point about the more voyeuristic parts of celebrity culture and its consequences. I think, um, 
well, look, the latter part of the film, she became that person that everyone could get a headline out of. And yeah, I guess it just became that. She, her life was lived in front of that camera, in front of the lens, and by the paparazzi. She became hugely famous in America for that re reason, actually. They liked the songs, but a song that, that kind of made her hit was Rehab, and it, everyone kind of thought it was hilarious that this woman singing that song was in a mess. Um, so it did become, I guess, that there was a comment about that, but it's about a lot of things. That's one of the elements, I guess, the film is about. Um, and the idea of when we were making it, it just felt like we found ourselves in the middle of it with her. And so there is a reason that a lot of people are asking us, why are you using that material? But it felt like we, it was kind of nasty and visceral to kind of show what it would be like under the under attack, I felt. So there was a, a conscious decision because the, the way she re kind of relates to the camera lens is something that we talked about at the beginning. She starts off kind of talking to her friends and talking to Nikki or talking to Lauren. And then at other times she's filming herself and then at other times it's her husband filming her and at other times, and then in the end it's like this paparazzi chasing after her, talking to her. She's fighting them off and they're saying, oh, come on, cheer up, you know. That, that became a part of her experience. So there was a conscious decision, obviously, to use that material to kind of show how it became more and more aggressive and nasty, the cam her relationship with the camera and publicity and press, I guess. Thank you, that was an amazing film. Um, Watching it was obviously very hard. Um, it's very depressing, torturous, frustrating, as well as fascinating. And I was just wondering from a filmmaker's point of view, how was it to be so immersed in that for three years and did it change you or affect you in any way? It's, it's a good one, bec good question, because yeah, what happened is these interviews were all, they, without realizing it, they became therapy sessions, you know. I'd be in a room with this person who I didn't know, and I'd ask him a question, and they'd be bottled up. They'd be closed down. I could see there was something wrong with this kid, because they're quite young still. <coughs> one by one, they would open up, and everyone would cry. Like, everyone would start crying. So we did the interviews um, in, in a sound studio in Soho Square. And um, so it'd just be a, a table, two chairs, a microphone. And the mixer was in another room, so it was just us alone. And um, the lighting was really harsh, so I used to turn the lights off. And we pretty much would sit there in the dark, just chatting. It's like doing radio or something. Um, and whatever they wanted to talk about, we'd talk about. And each person had so much baggage they were carrying. So once they'd walk out, I could tell they looked a little bit better. Is that even if the film didn't happen, they looked a little bit better. But then I'm now carrying this stuff, and the next person would come, and the next person, and the next person. And it's pretty, I'll be honest, it's a pretty heavy story. There's a lot of dark shit that went on around Amy. And, um, you know... We have a hint of it in the film. And, yeah, it was, it was, it was really like my producer and I would walk down the street going, shit, <laughs> are we going to make this movie? Are we going to be allowed? People kept saying also, I'll talk to you. You're never going to get this film out. You're never going to be able to make it. They won't let you. That came up all the time, all over the place. Because it could have been darker? You could have gone darker than you did? I don't know. They were all petrified by something or speaking out. They felt they were not able to be honest or to speak out. They felt... Nobody gave a shit what happened to Amy because everyone went along with it. Everyone laughed at those TV shows, even those nice guy comedians were making fun of them. You know, it was like the whole world just picked on this girl who was, had mental illness. And there her mates going, I cannot believe. Like, because they think, okay, at some point someone's going to stop it. When it goes to another stage, someone will stop it now, they'll see. Oh, she falls off a stage or she's really messed up, she ends up in hospital. All oh, right, she has, a, she has an overdose, someone will stop it. No, oh, she's on tour again. Well, someone... No, no, no. So so the tour sells the out. Company. Pardon? The record company. No, us. Who was watching the TV? Oh, it, Who it's the record... The no, it's interesting. Okay, there's a thing about record... I didn't know this. I'm not in the music business. Someone, the machine, is still putting on on tour. The label don't make the money, actually, when you're touring. They make the money from record sales. So it's the, the, the team behind make the money if you're performing. <clears throat> and so there's that, but it's also, it wasn't just that, it was the comedians, the newspapers, everything day to day, her friends would see. So all of that would come out when I'd talk to them, because they were like so angry with the world. And every single person had a story, some horrible stories that they told. <clears throat> and, and I was like, I don't know if this film's ever going to get made, but um, these people needed to get something off their chest. And now I'm kind of seeing them all, and they... In a way, they just didn't feel they could stand up and speak out. And it's kind of linked to your question. Because if they did, they'd get shouted down. And kind of it's happening now, in the press right now. If you talk anything, someone's going to shout me down. And then we looked at ourselves and said, look, we're kind of going to have to stand up and stay standing up. 
and just say this is what was going on. We've been as honest as we possibly could. <clears throat> it's been a tough film, but we kind of owe it to her, and I feel like I owe it to all of those people who privately have been carrying this grief and pain and have kind of talked to us, but are not able to do it alone. And so we were like, well, we're in this position. We should do our best to get the film out there. Um, and so that's why it was really heavy. It was quite emotional for everyone. <clears throat> and now I'm meeting a lot of these people, and they're all saying, you know, I'm really glad you've kind of stood up and listened, basically, because nobody listened. I think that's what happened. I think that's what's going on. Nobody seemed to listen. To, to the tragedy. Well, to them, what, yeah. or see mm. what was going on. I think that was the thing. Mm. We all know it. We can all look at it, and it all makes perfect sense. But, yeah. But there are plenty of other people who go through the music business and don't have to say I know, but that's the, that's the excuse, isn't it? Mm. Oh, well, it's happened loads of times. <laughs> cool. That's not, it's not a marketing tool that everyone dies young. That's stupid. Mm. You know, it's really it's genius to turn it into a marketing tool and we all fall for it. So it's kind of why I didn't want to put any of that bullshit in the film either. It's not cool. I don't know about anyone else. She wasn't born in the 60s. She was born down the road. She's younger than us. Mm. And uh, she was quite cool. She was quite funny. She was nice. She was an ordinary girl. Take her off the pedestal. She could have been any of you lot. Could have been my sister. Could have been my mate. But uh, that was what I found more interesting about it and her. I just wanted to say I'd be more interested in like the 10-year reflection on her life and how that the impact that she made on the world and the people that were around her. So to me, it felt like a bit of a more of a personal film. The outpouring of grief of people that were in her life at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I, I wanted to say. It was there the people I spoke to, but it's interesting because I didn't know that much about her. So I suppose that's the thing. I wasn't a hardcore fan. I never saw her live, but um, I just found that seeing her. I didn't know she could play the guitar, I didn't know she was that funny. There was loads of simple things. <clears throat> when I showed a cut to her, some friends quite early on, they were like really moved and affected just to see her being happy, because they couldn't even remember her being happy. They just remember her kind of being unhappy on stage or being moved from one place to another or going to in and out of court or whatever. So that, that, the simple things, I suppose, were the things I was interested, but who knows in 10 years' time. Yeah. There's a low, I mean, was there the, the question we, was, was there anything that you, that you wanted to mention but couldn't, that you felt you had to hold back? I mean, there's a load of stuff, yeah. Is the answer is yes. <clears throat> but just because it wasn't relevant or right for this film, or it's a long story, I guess is the answer. You know, all, there's so many subplots in every life. Um, we, we did talk to a lot of people, and there's not that many of them in the film. You know, there's so many subplots and stories that didn't make the final cut. Um, but there's always a reason why, you know, that, you know, there's some, a lot of dark stuff that went on. There's a lot of funny stuff that didn't get in there. There's amazing stuff of her doing more voices and things like that, which we didn't manage to put in. It's just the choices you have to make to conflate it all into the length. She died at the age of 27, which is the same age as Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Brian Basquiat, James. you know, Kurt Cobain. Have you found any connection to that number, the age of 27, because it's one of those things that's constantly talked about. There's a book called The 27th exactly. uh, Club. Right. Coming out. And yeah. I, I hate that term. Do you? Okay, yeah. well. Because it's, that, there's, it's not cool. They've just kind of turned it into this cool thing that people die at 27. So I, I, don't, I kind of do want to go into that. I don't know if there's anything in common. I think it's a bad kind of coincidence. And the problem is the more it becomes a book, and a cool term, then people who have an issue think, oh, maybe I should die at that age. Because you know what? I'll be part of that gang. And that's the problem. If you're not well, you start thinking, I don't know if I'm going to make it to 28, because maybe I'm troubled like they are. And I think that, I know that came up in her head in conversations with people. So it's the kind of thing I'd love to get rid of, because it's stupid. It's stupid to die at that age. Um, we, wouldn't, we don't celebrate it in authors or neurosurgeons or driving instructors or anything, but rock and roll somehow has made it cool to die young. It's stupid. Uh, the Yo. question was, she thought it was a very sensitive film. Uh, have, has Asif ever thought about what Amy herself might have thought about? Yeah, I'm sure publicly she would have hated it. I'm sure she would have dissed it. No, um, her friends would say that all the time. We don't want to be a part of it. Why? Because she wouldn't want this. She wouldn't want this. They've sort of changed their mind now. And they feel like, you know what, at least they people seeing a real Amy, as they called her. Um, so I, I hope she probably would be rude, but secretly, maybe I might get a nice phone call one day or something like that, and, you know, it might be kind of a jolly way of saying it's all right. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I hope so. I'm sure she'd rather people have a better picture of her than 
like well, a, a, full, a fuller work, picture, isn't yeah, it? Around the yeah, picture yeah. and understand the complexity of her life rather than she. You know, when I started the film, there was somebody that I know who said, "Oh, would well, you want to make a film about junkie?" That was his summation of her. And I was like, ah, that's why I got to make this film. People like you. Mm. Well, I think you totally addressed that and changed the perception of Amy. Uh, I'm really delighted that you could present it here at the East End Film Festival. I, think I was a like Stokey that. boy, born down the road, went there to school see. in Homerton. Very proud to be here. Nice to be back. And I think she would have liked that, being part of the East End Film definitely, Festival. Definitely, definitely. Well, I'm very glad that you are part of the East End Film Festival. Thank you all much for the fantastic questions and comments. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>